Good morning. I'm Pastor Christian Marquardt, and uh, welcome to St. James Lutheran Church. Very glad to have all of you here um, for our worship service this morning. Our kids are playing today. We've got the kids' handbells playing later on in the service, um, so it should be a really nice ser- service this morning. We are not in a series anymore. We have just finished our three-week series looking at a word from the prophets, but today's service is looking at um, another thing that comes up in the church, and that's uh, the jealousy that we have towards others also infects the church, which means the people become jealous of ministers. One minister becomes jealous of another minister. People get jealous of another's abilities or gifts or talents. And uh, so we're going to hear what God has to say about that later on in the service. But we're going to get started this morning with our opening hymn, which is hymn 471. You'll find that near the middle of the red hymnal. That hymn is called Renew Me, O Eternal Light. You'll also find the words displayed on the screen. May God bless our worship this morning. Amen. Please stand. We continue with the order of worship that is found in your service folder on page two. You will also find the words displayed on the screen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. O Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. O Lord, come quickly to help me. Give glory to God, our light and our life. Come, O Lord, let us worship you. 
Come, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come, enter in with our songs of praise. Come, enter in with thanksgiving. You are a great and a wondrous God, copying in your hands all the depths of earth. You made the hills and the mountains high. You made the seas and the dry land. Come, O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come, enter in with our songs of praise. Come, enter in with thanksgiving. Come, let us worship in bowing low. Kneel before the one who has made us all. You are the God whom we call our own. We are the flock that you shepherd. Come, O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come, enter in with our songs of praise. Come, enter in with thanksgiving. You may be seated. In the morning I will sing, I will sing glad songs to you. I will sing glad songs of praise to you. I will sing glad songs of praise to you. O oh God, you are my God, for you I long. For you my soul is thirsting, my body pines for you. Like a dry weary land without water, so I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory. In the morning I will sing, I will sing glad songs to you. I will sing glad songs of praise to you. I will sing glad songs of praise to you. For your love is better than life. My lips will speak your praise, so I will bless you all my life. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul shall be filled as with a banquet. My mouth shall praise you with joy. In the morning I will sing, I will sing glad songs to you. I will sing glad songs of praise to you. I will sing glad songs of praise to you. On my bed I remember you. On you I muse through the night, for you have been my help. In the shadow of your wings I rejoice, my soul clings to you. Your right hand holds me fast. In the morning I will sing, I will sing glad songs to you. I will sing glad songs of praise to you. 
I will sing glad songs of praise to you. Our worship continues this morning with a children's devotion. So kids, if you want to make your way over to the first pew or two. All right, everybody. How many of you have a pet? Some of you have pets. What's your pet? You have a dog? Okay, what do you have? Uh, we have, well, I don't really have a pet, but our family has three parakeets and a lizard. Three parakeets and a lizard. Are any of them yours? Okay. So you don't have any pets. <laughs> Who else has a pet? Anybody? What's your, you have a pet specifically? What's your pet? Okay, you have a lizard. Did you get to name the lizard? Okay, that's how you know if it's your pet. If you get to name it, then it's your pet. Doesn't mean you have to take care of it. You had a pet. Uh-oh. Well, pets do that sometimes. All right, what's your, na- what's your lizard's name? Roman the lizard. Did you get to name the dog? Your family named the dog. Did you vote on it? What's the dog's name? Ellie the dog. I think it's good when parents let their kids have pets um, because it gives you some experience taking care of a pet, and it also gives you experience naming a pet. And it's good to give kids experience naming pets because one day they might have kids of their own and have to name them, and then by then they've already gotten all the bad names out of their system. Because sometimes, if, you know, if people don't have pets, they give their kids weird names like Rufus. You know, Nobody wants to be named Rufus. That's a dog's name. But there are people who have been named Rufus. You know why that happened? It's because they never had a pet. That's why. So, as we go through these verses, there's going to be two names of people, and they sound kind of funny. Uh, But the interesting thing is, there doesn't seem to be anything special about them, but they're doing something really special. So, if you want to go to the first slide, and then I'll read it, and I'll go to the next slide. So, here's what's happening. The Lord said to Moses... Bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took of the spirit that was on him, and he put the spirit on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. In the next slide. However, two men, and here are the names, whose names were Eldad and Medad, had remained in the camp. Yet the Spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. So a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his Spirit on them. So we have two kind of weird names, Eldad and Medad. It's like naming... Your son after your dad. That's kind of what it sounds like. But they were doing something kind of cool. They were prophesying. So they were speaking God's words to the people, which normally ordinary people didn't do. Normally ordinary people would go to um, hear what the prophet had to say, what the priest had to say, but the ordinary people didn't do that. But right now we see that God's people, a whole bunch of them, were just prophesying. They were all talking about Jesus. And Joshua You've heard of Joshua before. Anybody want to tell me what Joshua did? I just need one person. Raise your hand. Tell me what Joshua did. What did Joshua do? Yes. So after Moses, Joshua was, was in charge, and he took the people all the, way, all the way around the city of Jericho and into the promised land. And here Joshua is learning a good lesson. Because Joshua says... Shouldn't we stop these people from talking about God? And Moses says, no, we shouldn't do that. Do you think I'm going to be jealous? Are you jealous for me? He says, no, I wish all of God's people were prophets. I wish all of them had the ability and the the, uh, know-how to talk about God. And you know what? We're not living in Old Testament times anymore. We're living in New Testament times. And God gives all of us the ability to talk about him. 
And that's why it's good to learn about him. That's why it's good to learn in Sunday school and in school and in your own personal Bible reading time because you are going to have opportunities to talk about God just like these people did. And when that happens, I'm not going to be jealous, like you're taking something away from me, but it's God giving something to you. So we're going to fold our hands, and we're going to pray and thank God for giving us the opportunity to talk about him. Dear Lord, we thank you that you've brought us together as a church, as a group of people who all have different strengths and abilities, Um, Some of us know more than others, but you give all of us opportunities to talk about you. You give us all, all of us opportunities to share Jesus with people. And we know that everybody needs to hear about Jesus because Jesus lived and died to forgive us. Lord, please give us opportunities, give us your spirit so that we can also speak about you as well. We pray this in your name. Amen. Good job, everybody. Take care of your pets. And I think you're going to play a song. Is that right? The kids are helping a lot, a lot out in the service today, so I'm just going to... <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks for all the practicing and time and parents. Uh, thank you for helping them with that. Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. Um, In these verses, once again, we see, not in an Old Testament context, but a New Testament context, the issue of being jealous in ministry. Here, uh, Jesus' disciples come to him and say, hey, we saw somebody doing something really good. We saw him casting out demons, but it wasn't you, and it wasn't us, so should we stop them? And as you would expect, Jesus' answer is, no, of course not. If somebody is doing something for me, um, if somebody is doing something for the kingdom of God, then you shouldn't stop them, even if, they're part, not, even if they're not part of your group, because God accomplishes many things through many people, and we can't get the attitude, he's only doing it through me, because that's not the case. A reading from Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 38. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in my name can, in the next moment, say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name, because you belong to Christ, will certainly not lose his reward. And if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. 
Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. This is the word of our God. Amen. Amen. Our worship this morning continues with our next hymn. That's hymn number 462, Oh, That the Lord Would Guide My Ways. You'll find that near the middle of the red hymnal, the words are also displayed on the screen. The text for our consideration this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 1. The reading begins at verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. This is the word of our God. Amen. Amen. I want to take a moment and have us think about mature, experienced Christians that we've known, people from the past, people who have gone on before us, people who have passed away in faith, people who have died, and to think about what their experience passing through that moment meant for us. And I'll give you an example because I don't know all of your examples yet. I know many of them, but I don't know all of them. And my example um, is that of my grandma, who got pancreatic cancer and passed away. And pancreatic cancer is one of those ones where if you get it, by the time you know it, um, it's often too late. And I know that some people have gotten ill and have lost their health um, and have lost their faith because they've said, God has abandoned me, God is forgetting about me because if God really cared about me, He would not have let this happen. I know that some people have done that, but that was not my grandma's response. 
That wasn't the way she processed things. Her attitude was, God is good, God is good all the time. And so even in the face of adversity, even as I'm going through this, even as I have cancer, God must still be good. And I was able to visit her a few times. She lived down in Illinois. My parents lived in Wisconsin. But we we drove down um, every other weekend to go and see her and help her sort through things and figure things out. And, you know, near the end, she was just getting weaker and weaker and uh, had lost a lot of her her strength and energy. And I asked her. um, I asked her a question that I really wanted to know. I said what do you think the purpose of life is? Me being a thoughtful young man who's still trying to figure out the world and trying to hear from different sources, what do people think the purpose of life is? This old lady who trusts in Christ, my grandma, um, as she's dying, what's she going to say the purpose of life is? What was worthwhile for her to do while she still had strength and energy to do it? And she said, the purpose of life is to know Christ and his love for us, that he would die on the cross to save us from our sins. And that was less than a month before she died. And now she's with Jesus. A much better place, a much better situation. And one day I'll see her too. But that moment stuck with me. And I, every so often I think about that once again, Um, that in the face of adversity, a Christian who was suffering and perhaps even struggling was able to say, no, God is still good. And that can be such a comforting thing, such a good example for the future, because Lord knows what I'm going to face years down the road. And I don't know all of your stories. I've heard some of them of a loved one who has passed away, who has trusted in Christ, and as they've gone through that process, as their own strength has gone, they've relied more and more on God and had him hold them up when they couldn't hold themselves up. And also to recognize that our brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow believers, can be so comforting and encouraging as well. But that's the sort of mindset that we have to get into as we look at these verses as Paul is in prison. And he says, this is a really good thing. He says, I'm I'm glad I'm in prison. I'm glad that the situation has worked out the way it has. He doesn't quite say it like that, but he's basically saying that as he says, I want you to know, brothers, fellow believers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And what Paul is saying is, the fact that I'm in prison in Rome, awaiting trial before Caesar, this is a really good thing for God's people. It's good that I'm in prison. It's good that I'm waiting on trial for years on end. It's good that I'm here. And here's why. He says, as a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And I don't, <clears throat> I don't know what the makeup of the church at Philippi was, but if there's anyone from that church, that gathering of Christians, who had served in the Roman military, they would have known what Paul was talking about. This is the palace guard. This is the praetorian guard. This is the elite set of guards among the Roman people, and some of them, apparently, were taking shifts watching Paul. And they might have found two different people as they were talking to Paul. They might have found a man who was a believer in Christ, a man who seemed to be down on his luck, and a man who gave up on the very reason that he was in prison in the first place. Paul might have said, you know, I was preaching Christ, now I'm in jail. Turns out that was a waste of my time because if God was good, I would not be in jail right now. But that's not what Paul says. Instead, he was able to give a clear witness to Christ and everybody who was there, all the guards, all the attendants, everybody who was around Paul was able to say, this man has not committed a crime. This man believes in his God. This man is very religious. But he's done nothing wrong. And Paul says, 
This is a net positive because it has given me the opportunity to tell more people about Jesus. And Paul knew that God was good all the time. The time when Paul looked like he was at the peak of his career, God took him and made him realize he was at the bottom. As Paul was a Pharisee, on the road to Damascus, arresting Christians, throwing them in jail, opposing the gospel message, even having some of them killed, Paul was at the peak of his career as a Jewish man. He could go no higher. He was a rising star. Everybody looked to Paul. Paul, you're the guy who cares so deeply about the faith that you'll have Christians killed to stop their message. And then Jesus appeared to him. And Paul realized that for all his earthly success, he was nothing. In fact, he had been opposing Christ. But God took Paul with that same spirit and energy and said, Paul, now you're going to work for me. And where Paul had previously had success and had everyone his side, now everyone was against him. And he was stoned, and he was left for dead, and he went back into the city, and he was shipwrecked, and he was imprisoned, and he was beaten, and he went hungry, and now he's in jail. Before, he had all the success in the world. Now, he faces adversity at every turn. And he's in prison, and he's still preaching the gospel. Because God took him when he felt like he was at his highest, but made him say, Paul, you don't know me at all. I'm going to teach you about the gospel now, and forgiveness, and love, and mercy to those who don't deserve it. And so Paul took that message, and he shared it with everyone that he could find, even when he was in prison, because God was still good to him. Verse 14 says, Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. I'm going to go back to my grandmother again. As she was going through that experience, me being an impressionable young man, her suffering in pain all the time, you know, if she had said, God isn't good, or I don't, I don't believe in God anymore, or God doesn't love me, God doesn't care about me, that would have stuck with me too. I would have remembered that. I'm not saying that that would have been enough to sway all my opinions and my thoughts about God, but it would have, it would have been her witness of what she had seen. It would have been discouraging. Here we have Paul in prison, and instead of being discouraged or let down, he says, wow, this is a great opportunity to share Jesus with more people who haven't heard it. The Roman guards haven't heard about Jesus yet. The people in the, in the palace in Rome, they, they don't know about Christ yet, so I'm going to tell them. And so Paul is finding even more success, even in prison. And people outside heard about it. Hey, did you hear that Paul got arrested? The great evangelist Paul, the guy who went around and shared the gospel, Paul, he's in jail? Oh, that's too bad. Is he depressed? Has he given up? Is he sad about it? Is he just waiting for the day that they execute him? No, that's, that's not what's happening at all. Instead, he's actually revitalized. He tells the guards about Christ. He tells everyone about Christ. He won't even stop. Think of how encouraging it would be to hear something like that. And I'm not saying we should put our hope in people and in people's responses, but it's just so encouraging to see the gospel bear fruit in somebody's heart so much that they would recognize Christ is good, even in adversity like that. And then, it turns out that not everybody was excited about Paul's ongoing ministry success, even though he was in prison. Some people were not happy about it. Some people saw this as an opportunity. They said, Paul, the evangelist, everybody followed him, everybody listened to him, 
He would write a letter, he would send it to a city, they would read it with excitement, they would say, wow, we got a letter from Paul, this is great, let's read it over and over again. But Paul's in jail now. This is our opportunity to take some of the spotlight for ourselves. Now we can be the preachers, now we can be the teachers, now we can be the religious experts, now that Paul is in jail. And Paul says, people have had different motivations for proclaiming Christ since I've been in jail. He says, it's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But he doesn't even care. Paul is not insecure about his position. He's not concerned that people are going to stop listening to him because he doesn't care about his position anyway. He doesn't care about the accolades or the fame or the accomplishments, only that he's following Christ. If Jesus said, Paul, here's what you're going to do, Paul said, all right, that's where I'll go because I'm not preaching my message anyway. I'm not talking about my authority, my ability, none of that. Even my story is not about me, it's about Christ. And wherever Christ is, that's a success. Because these people need to hear the gospel. They need to hear about the God who loves them, the Jesus who lived for them, who died for them, who has forgiven their sins. People need to know that. Whether I'm the one to proclaim that or somebody else, I don't care. I just want them to hear it. So some of Paul's friends on the outside were still proclaiming the gospel, still teaching about Jesus. And others were doing that, but not because they really cared about Jesus. It was because they cared about all the other things. They cared about the opportunity to speak in a room and had all the other people be silent. They cared about the opportunity to teach, to take a verse, to pick it into pieces, to explain every single thing that was going on in it and have people listen and agree. They did so because they liked the platform, the opportunity. They did all of these things. They talked about Jesus because they just wanted their own name to be out there. And that sounds bad. And it is. But Paul is not even that concerned about it. Because the only thing Paul really cares about is that Christ is preached, is that people get the opportunity to hear about a God who loves them, who forgives them, who has mercy on them. And Paul knows that everybody needs to hear that because that's what he needed. Paul says, I need to hear about a God who is powerful and has promised something beyond this life. I don't even care that I'm in prison because I know heaven's waiting for me on the other side. So I want people to hear about Christ, even if people have the wrong motivations. And that can even be comforting for us right now in 2021. Because there are a lot of churches all around the world And if you look at the history of the Christian church, it started splitting up almost immediately. Despite Jesus' prayer for his disciples in John chapter 17, praying that they would be united, that they would be one, almost immediately they started splitting apart. And over the years they split and they split and they split. And now in the city of Milwaukee, there are, are probably 200 churches, 300 churches, all with different names, slightly different denominations. There's a lack of unity. On top of that, it doesn't even matter what church you go to, whether you go to this one or a different one. I'm not saying that it doesn't matter, but you will hear something very similar, no matter what church you go to. Here at fill-in-the-blank Christian church, we figured it out. We figured out the Bible. We figured out all the right understanding. We have the right approach to be able to share that with people. 
We've built the right kind of community here at Fill in the Blank Christian Church. This is a great church. It's the best church. It's the only good church. And there are many people in churches right now that are not St. James. But as long as Christ is preached, I don't care. We don't have room in the pews for everyone in the city of Milwaukee anywhere. We need to care that Christ is preached, that people get to hear about Jesus forgiving their sins. Anything much beyond that, we can figure out later. But is Christ preached? And Christ is preached even in churches that teach things that are completely opposite to the Bible. Because the gospel is so powerful, it can overwhelm even the person who's speaking it so that Christ still comes through. Even in places that don't even believe in Jesus. Mormons do not believe in Jesus. Not Jesus as God. Jesus is a good guy. Jesus is a prophet. Jesus as God? No. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in Jesus as God. And yet, because the gospel is so powerful, there will be people who are Jehovah's Witnesses, who are Mormons, who end up in heaven. And the only reason that can happen is because somehow, if this is in the room, then Christ will be preached. And I don't say that to excuse the message. I don't say that to excuse false doctrine. But I know that God is so powerful and his word is able to reach hearts that wherever God's word is read, the Holy Spirit is at work in people. And that's how Paul could say, these people who are acting with selfish motives, who don't even care about Jesus but talk about him anyway, just so they can become popular and famous, yeah, that happens now. That was happening back then. But Paul can say that because Christ was still preached. God's word was still proclaimed. And that means even if the person who's speaking it doesn't understand it, the Holy Spirit is going to work and touch people's hearts. And I have to think about that. When I hear about some of the first Christian missionaries, people who came over to the United States, people who told the indigenous people living here, convert or die. And that happened in places. And that's not the right attitude when it comes to sharing the gospel. It doesn't sound like you're going to leave much room for the Holy Spirit to touch people's hearts, convert or die. Well, I'm going to say I believe in Jesus even if I don't because I don't want to die. And for as bad as that was, God's word was still proclaimed, Christ was still preached, and people were still saved. And I don't say that to excuse the methodology. I don't say that to excuse the doctrine. I say that to comfort and encourage you to know that this is not the only tiny little church in the entire world where people get to hear about Christ and go to heaven. As Paul said, the important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Amen. Our worship continues as we use uh, the words of the song that's on page six. Uh, the title is, You Are God, We Praise You. Uh, you'll find that on pages six and seven in your worship folder. Uh, the words will also be, be displayed on the screen. Please stand as we join in singing that song together. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O Father holy, all creation offers praise. 
with the angels in heaven, with the cherubim and seraphim, with apostles and prophets, With the martyrs and your holy church, we sing in endless praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O Father holy, all creation offers praise. Sorry. O Jesus Christ, the Son of God, O Spirit most holy, to the Trinity most blessed, we sing in endless praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim creation offers praise. O Christ, King of glory, you became a man to set us free. You have risen to free us. And with all your saints in glory, we sing in endless praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O Father holy, all creation offers praise. All creation offers praise. All creation offers praise. We stand for prayer. Lord of power and grace, whose eyes are on the righteous and whose ears are open to their cry, hear the prayer of your people as we come now in thankfulness for the mercies that you pour down on us anew each day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the Savior of the world. Grant that we may believe in him with all our hearts, learning from him the great truths of the kingdom to which he bore faithful witness. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may produce the fruits of righteousness. May he endow us with unwavering faith, that we might always be ready to do your will. Guide and uphold us during our earthly pilgrimage, and bring us all to our heavenly home. Receive these petitions in the name of the Prince of Life, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. O Lord, have mercy on us. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power, and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
Once again, good morning, everyone. Good to have all of you here. Thanks again to the kids for playing. Thanks to Carrie Durr for playing piano this morning. Thanks to Becca for organizing the kids and forcing them to do things. It was so nice. Um, a couple things that I want to be sure to announce. One of them is something that was in the bulletin last Sunday, but was not officially announced. Um, Margaret McDonald has retired, as I believe many, if not all of you, are aware. Um, she did not want to do a formal meal celebration sort of thing uh, that was not with her wishes. So um, we are presenting her with a gift um, in, in keeping with our policy to give a gift to people as they are retiring. Uh, but there's additionally a box in the back for cards. Now, I don't know if any of you read the announcement last Sunday. Um, I wasn't going to announce it because she was in church last Sunday. <laughs> but um, if you'd like, the box is there today. It'll be there next Sunday as well. And um, if, you have, if you'd like to give her a card or, or something, um, you're welcome to do that. She just didn't want it to be this big public thing, you know. Um, let's see. On, uh, on the bulletin is something, today is National Life Chain Sunday. St. James is not organizing anything um, in particular. We just don't have the manpower to do that. But there are a couple things, if you're interested, uh, different events happening this week um, and or next week that's in the bulletin. There are also some gummy bears out in, the, uh, in those little baggies outside. They're right outside the church. There are also some in the gathering place, uh, just recognizing at one point we were very small. And God took care of us and has grown us to where we are now. So um, giving thanks for the gift of life, certainly a good thing to do today. Um, I feel like there was one other thing. That's right. Next Sunday, I will not be here. Um, I will be away on the men's retreat. Our men's, our men's morning ministry group takes a retreat every single year. And this, I'll be gone next weekend. But we will have a special guest preacher. Um, it's Pastor Phil Merton. He... Um, He's a big part of Wells Institutional Ministries, and I believe he'll also be giving some kind of a presentation. Um, he's a good guy, so even though I won't be here, he'll be here, and it'll be, just, it'll be nice to hear from him and hear how that ministry is going and how, how God is blessing it. I, it's one of those cases where you have the right guy in the right position, and then the Lord blesses that. Additionally, 50 Plus is happening on Wednesday, right? Is that right? Okay, yes. <laughs> 50 Plus is happening on Wednesday, and we're starting a new topic. We're going to be going through the fruits of the Spirit. So 50 Plus meets Wednesdays at 1 p.m., the first and third Wednesday. Anybody who's 50 Plus, welcome to show up. The, we meet right here in the gathering place, um, so you're welcome to join us for that. I think that's about all I had to mention. I know um, Steve Growth has an announcement that he would also like to make. What's that? Oh yeah, the youth group is meeting this Saturday already. We're starting up. I won't be there, but it'll be good. It's happening in the youth room, yes. There has been a lot of hard work from a lot of people trying to get that room ready for the youth group. So um, be sure to look at that announcement also in the bulletin. I think that's everything. All right. God's blessings on your Sunday. Good morning. About seven or eight years ago, the congregation kind of recognized that we didn't put a lot of attention or emphasis on stewardship, and so the voters adopted a goal at that time that was recommended by the council to uh, provide quarterly stewardship uh, reports and notices to the congregation. You may remember receiving those over the years. And then about two, la two years later, we kind of restructured those reports. So for about the last five years or so, we've been, you've been receiving regularly, regular quarterly reports in your mailbox. Each one of those reports uh, throughout the year has a different emphasis and a different focus on an aspect of stewardship. And when people hear the word stewardship, they often think of money, but stewardship is much more than that. It's, it's how we respond to God with not only the monetary gifts that we've received, but also how we respond with the gifts of, of our time and of our skills and abilities. So the four reports that are distributed, um, the one is, does focus on, on finances and your, and your offerings. 
The second one focuses on worship and communion attendance, and then the other two are on small groups, particip participation, and your uh, service or opportunities and participation. Um, this morning, as you leave, uh, if you check your mailboxes, you'll find that the first of those reports, the one on finances, is for this year is in your mailbox, and we. We recognize that over, over the last several years, there seems to have been a little bit of confusion about the purpose of these reports. Plus, we also have a lot of new members since then, so we thought it would be a good idea just, just to reintroduce them and, and what the purpose is. So the report that you'll find uh, is in a sealed envelope because it's got your financial information on it. Uh, but it, look, it looks like this. The top part of the report uh, is just an introduction on basic stewardship principles that we find in the Bible for uh, proportional first fruits giving and what that means. Um, it then identifies that the purpose of this report is not to shame anybody or call anybody out. In fact, the council doesn't look at the numbers that are in here. This is strictly provided to you as a tool to do a self-evaluation as to where your offerings are at and how they, uh, and, and do a reflection on, you know, does that, uh, does, is that a uh, proper response to how you have been blessed by God? Um, then it does identify what your offerings have been over the last, over our last fiscal year, and our fiscal year, year runs from September 1st through August 31st, so that's the figures that are, that are in here. Um, this is the first of, our re of the reports that we do because our budget was just adopted in August, so we thought that timing-wise it made sense to do the financial one at this time. And then the bottom half of, the, of this first page has a, a chart where you can kind of see if my income is this much and I want, and I want to give 5% or 10% or whatever it might be, you can kind of see where you land in there. And then finally it ends up at the bottom with an encouragement to you to, uh, to, to do a reflection and follow uh, the principle or, uh, or the biblical principles of first fruits proportional giving. The back side of the report talks about our budget. Now our giving shouldn't be based on what our budget is. It should be a reflection of how we've been blessed. Uh, but some people do find the information helpful as they do that self-reflection. So it's just a very quick summary of, of our budget and how it's been uh, distributed in various areas. Um, if you want more detail, on the budget that was provided at the uh, August uh, voters meeting and if you don't have a copy of those minutes you can contact the church office and and get a copy of the budget and then finally at the bottom of that back page um, some observations about our budget and uh, and and uh, how we should be able to, to really with the size of our congregation meet that budget with with no difficulty at all so again, this is provided to you solely for your use as a self-reflection um, to, to, to look at where your offerings are at and, how, and whether that's a proper response to how you've been blessed over the years. And I hope, hope you find it helpful.